you would agree with me. You're, you're monologuing. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm talking too much. My apologies. You've got me all excited. Well, it, well and, and I, I believe I'm understanding... I'm understanding perhaps your reason for calling. And, and I'm getting the impression that you call a lot of different faiths, a lot of different people with the idea of finding ones that are not, like, like you said, they're not 100% in their faith. And I, and I guess to save us both time, I am 100%, and, and I am not interested in hearing uh, or entertaining thoughts that's going to argue whether or not Jehovah's Witnesses have the truth. I know Jehovah's Witnesses aren't perfect. I know the organization isn't perfect. And any any real and faithful Jehovah's Witness would tell you so. But we're people of faith who are trying to do what we've learned from the scriptures. And so with that in mind, I, I don't see where this conversation is headed. And can I share one more scripture? Yes, of course. I, I did talk an awful lot. So, yes, I'd love to listen to what you have to say. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And I, and I appreciate, I, I believe, in, to some degree, you are searching for something. And, and that's commendable. Uh, we all need to be asking questions and looking. <laughs> um, but what I'd like to share is in Matthew chapter 27. Yep. And this is an example of, of where Jesus himself responded to people who were questioning him. So in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 11... How, how does that read in, in your copy of the Bible? Yep, yeah, yeah, this is the New King James Version. Uh, Matthew twenty seven eleven. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, "Are you the King of the Jews?" So Jesus said to him, "It is as you say." So did he use scripture to answer that? Not in not in that case. And now notice in verse twelve, the chief priests and the elders now also begin to give their attention to Jesus. And how, how does it describe that they do so? And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. So, but, but remember, like I mentioned earlier, okay, yep, that but, accusational approach, pardon? you probably will not get a response. Response so if, to if what? You're searching for answers. Sorry? Uh, uh, answer to what? If you're searching for answers and you sincerely want them, I, I would encourage you to look for a way of doing it that's not accusational because you'll probably get a response from Jehovah's Witnesses much like Jesus. When being accused by the chief priests, he, he did not answer. I'm I'm not accusing you other than my statement that the 2013 Watchtower was dishonest. But apart from that, all and I'm doing has been asking... Body is not scriptural. Pardon? And that the governing body is not scriptural. Well, there isn't that a governing body thing. anywhere and in the Bible. These are no, no a, a, a governing body, if you go to the dictionary, a governing body is the legal leadership of a corporation. Yeah. Now, in the Bible, you do not find any mention of a governing body. Now, if I'm wrong, uh, you can say I'm being accusational, but I'm challenging you. If I'm wrong, show me where the scripture says in the Greek or Hebrew governing body. It, it doesn't, because governing body is the uh, ruling legal entity for a charity or a business corporation. And, and it, okay, that, and it, would be the, that would be the modern-day English legal definition of such a thing, of a governing body, right? Yeah. So, what, in scripturally, so let's, let's take this governing body idea and, and apply scripture to it. 
the nation of Israel, who by modern day de definitions would be a corporation, right? No, it was a. It, w it wasn't a corporation. It was a theocracy. God was to, supposed to be the ruler of Israel. Okay, and he had human representatives mm -hmm. through Moses, through Aaron, through the priests, and in the first century Christian congregation. No, that's a totally separate entity. The 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 um. The Jewish system, the Jewish theocratical system, the, the Old Covenant was abolished at Christ's resurrection when the New Covenant came in. And the whole Jewish system was physically destroyed by the Romans in AD, AD 70 with the destruction of the Temple. Uh, I'm not under any Levitical Old Testament laws about paying tithes or obeying the law of the lever or you know, only walking up to a so many hundred steps on, on a Sabbath sure. or not eating pork or shellfish. I'm not under any of those regulations. Right. I'm a New Covenant right. Christian. That's, that's the context that applies to me. The scriptures in the New Covenant apply to me. Okay. So but what I'm attempting to do is reason using scripture yep. and your knowledge of the scriptures. You have a good knowledge. Uh, so I'm attempting to use that to help you to understand why the term governing body is used. Not in a, in a modern day legal sense, but from a scriptural point of view. Does, does that make sense? No, because you're going against your own literature. Which in that 2013 watchtower says, In 1919, Jesus selected capable anointed brothers to be his faithful and discreet slave. And then to the left of that, it explains what the faithful and discreet slave is. The faithful and discreet slave, a group of anointed brothers who are directly involved in preparing and dispensing spiritual food during Christ's presence. Today, these anointed brothers make up the governing body. So... From this Watchtower 2013 onwards, I think there was another um, snippet of Watchtower which actually started teaching this from 2012, but I'm, I'm not too sure um, of the exact reference. What the Watchtower is saying is that the governing body is the faithful and discreet slave, which was appointed in 1919, and that governing body is an American legal corporation. That, that runs the Watchtower Track, Watchtower Bible and Track Society of Pennsylvania and New York, as well as other corporations such as ISBN, and here in the UK the Watchtower Bible and Track Society of Britain, which are the legal identifications. Yeah. Because yeah. the ruling authorities require a legal identification. But, but you, but your book says that Jesus, it says, quote, in 1919, Jesus selected capable anointed brothers to be his faithful and discreet slave. Now, that's simply not true. That, no, that is, that is simply not true, sir. Because... Um, How do you know? Well, because the Finnish mystery... Why, why do you say that? Well, I can give you proof. Um, the Finnish mystery, published in 1917, the first edition, not in later editions, but the first edition on page five, says that Pastor Russell was the faithful and discreet slave. So it wasn't a plural faithful and discreet slave, it was Pastor Russell alone. And I can give you another piece of evidence, which is the Watchtower, 1st of April, 1920, page 101, which says, quote, No one in present truth for a moment doubts that Brother Russell filled the office of the faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season, Matthew twenty four forty five. So, in 1917, in the Finnish Mystery, page 5, and the Watchtower, 1st of April, 1920, page 101, there are many other quotes I can give. It says that Pastor Russell alone filled the faithful and wise servant. And it said no one in present truth could for a moment doubt that. So there wasn't a governing body that were the faithful and discreet slave. Okay, 
that teaching that the governing body alone are the faithful and discreet slave, I think it actually came in in 2012 in some obscure Watchtower publication. Uh, but it was um, uh, officially distributed to the whole congregation en masse in that Watchtower of the 15th of July 2013. And, and, and at the time... In 1919, the Watchtower was teaching, this is page, 100, page 150, 144 of the Finnish Mystery, and I've got a copy of that book, 1917 and 1918 and 1924 editions of that book. It says on page 144, it uses the term beyond the veil, which means after a person has died. It's Old English, meaning after you're dead. It says that Pastor Russell has passed beyond the veil, but he's still guiding the society from beyond the veil, which means he's guiding the Watchtower Society from beyond the grave. Now, that, sir, you know, um, with respect, that is necromancy. That's, that's contact with the dead. The idea that the dead are um, running the Watchtower Society from beyond the grave. I mean, it's 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 blasphemy. Um, let me just read it. Page one hundred and forty-four yeah. of the Finnish mystery. Do you believe in the resurrection? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do, but not as you believe it. Um, uh, it's it says, and another angel, not the voice of the Lord, mentioned in the pre preceding chapter, but the corporate body. Dash the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, which Pastor Russell formed to finish his work. This verse, that's uh, eight three. I think it's Revelation eight three. It could be Ezekiel eight three. This verse shows that though Pastor Russell had passed beyond the veil, that means death, he is still maintaining every feature of the harvest work. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society is the greatest corporation in the world because from the time of its organisation until now, the Lord has used it as his channel through which to make known the glad tidings. Um, now, it, it's pure necromancy to say Pastor Russell's guiding the Watchtower Society from beyond the grave. That ain't Christian. That's pagan. You know, not even the Mormons, who are pretty bad, go that far. And in that 2013 well, Watchtower... Appreciate... Sorry? I could appreciate why, without complete knowledge, you would you would believe that. But this is the thing. is You mentioned you believe in the resurrection. Yep. And, and we do as well. You mentioned it not as we do, and, and I understand that. Not everyone does. Um, but how about Christ's presence? Um, if you want to go According on to a different to topic, could we talk at a different well, day? Because I prefer to stick to one topic at a time and not sort of in mid-topic change the topic onto something else. I, I did that with a Seventh-day Adventist. I spoke to him for three months and every 10 minutes he changed the topic and we never got to the bottom of anything. You, you know, you could, it's so, best to discuss so. one topic, discuss every aspect of it. I don't care if it takes an hour or 10 hours. And then once you've dealt with every aspect of that topic, you never discuss it again and you go on to topic number two, which you then discuss no matter how long it takes, you do every aspect of that topic. Once you've done topic two, you never discuss it again. You go on to topic three. The worst thing so to do is, is every time you speak, every 10 minutes, you're changing, you're changing the topic because you never get the, to the bottom of, of anything. <laughs> so, so, Robert, can you describe a hand to me? But I want you to only talk about the thumb. Uh, no, 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 I, I couldn't. Yeah. So to describe the governing body, to help to understand the governing body, to understand the modern day organization, to understand the faithful and discreet slave, you must describe more than one aspect of it. It cannot be described only by a thumb. Well, the governing body are simply, 
your nine leaders. I don't know what happened to uh, Brother Tony Morris. I used to like listening to his um, broadcasts about tight pants. I found them rather entertaining. And also pillows, his talk on the pillows, you know, and um, the cleaning that they have to do for the pillows. That was rather entertaining. And um, um, I forgot the thread of, thread of my thought. Um, Sorry, what was your what was your question? So you, you you were telling me we need to stick to one subject, right? Um, and then you asked me a question about thumbs and hands. Yeah, because I was using it as an illustration to help understand why I was not changing subjects. I was change, I was bringing in another aspect of the hand so as to paint a better picture. Right. Well, I don't know the point I was going to make. I'm afraid. This is my uh, sixth or seventh conversation of the day, so I'm, I'm quite tired, and um, um, we've been speaking for some time. I, I, would, I would imagine uh, this, this approach and this topic and on many different religious ideas and faiths, and um, to do that all day long, you'd need the power of Christ for sure. Well, uh I do, I do I pray for that. that. <laughs> I, I do pray for that. Um, I've got over, f I've got 550 discussions with various, various groups such as Winners Chapel, RCCG, the Mormons, the Christadelphians, Oneness Pentecostals, and of course the ICC, the International Christian Church, were particularly nasty. Um, so I've got 550 recordings of those people up on YouTube. And I've got over two and a half thousand Jehovah's Witness recordings. I've I probably covered ninety percent of all the all the congregation. Sorry, ninety percent of all the kingdom halls in the UK. I haven't done ninety percent of the congregations, but of the roughly one thousand three hundred British um, congregations, I reckon I've covered close to ninety percent of all the kingdom halls in the UK. And, and so now you're, you've moved into the U.S. as well? Yeah, yeah. I got a Skype account for a month. It's all I could afford, so I got a Skype account. And I thought, well, I'll give those American Jehovah's Witnesses a ring and spoil <laughs> them with my, my questions. I, I do agree. I can be a little harsh. I don't always get everything right. I do make mistakes. Um, well, I fully admit to that. Robert. <laughs> but thank you very much for your, for your time and if you want to speak another time on the resurrection I'd, happy, I'd be happy to do that but not at the moment we've probably been talking for about an hour and I cannot think straight oh. well I, I appreciate your, your kindness and your willingness and, and yeah if, if I feel like I've got some time and can focus myself. It, it takes it takes a good focus to be able to to reason on the scriptures at a depth that you're that you're at. So that that's that's commendable. Well, I do cheat a little bit because I tend to do the same topic over and over again. I'll sort of choose one topic and have five or six or seven discussions on that topic. Then I get bored and I go on to a different topic, which again I do five, six, seven times. Uh, and so because I'm doing the same thing repeatedly, I do tend to know it fairly well. And I think my discussions do get better towards the end, you know, once I've had numerous discussions on the same topic. Um, but I used to be a member of a cult. I used to be a oneness Pentecostal. And um, I do feel that what I'm doing warns people. If the people I'm speaking to don't want to listen to me, I mean, you seem a decent, honourable man. and um, But a lot of the people I, I speak to just scream down the phone at me. They don't listen to anything that I say. But I do it oh, because, well. because um, these recordings help people. Um, one of the proudest things I've done, very, very proud, in that um, here in the UK we have a particularly... Uh, nasty group called the ICC, the International Christian Church, who target students, particularly students in London. And um, I actually had a Bible study with the ICC. It is highly aggressive, highly manipulative. Um, the first principle studies 
um, they will usually gang up on one person. So it's one person they've invited to a Bible study. When I did it, I had 30 people in the room around me, a huge room. I was in the middle with their leader of the Northeast London section. And it usually gets very quickly onto the subject. And please, I'm not trying to be crude or offensive, but they usually start off by asking you questions about masturbation. Then they want to go into what is your sexual history? You know, the first time you kissed a girl or you ever done anything else, you know, whatever. Um, and what I didn't know was that they have note takers. They have two note takers who take notes of what you're saying. So, of course, they can use that against you later on. Scientology do the same thing. It's probably why John Travolta can't leave Scientology. They just know too much about him. And um, I'm very, very pleased because I've had four discussions with Michael Williamson, who's the head of the not just the UK, but the whole of Europe. He's the section leader for the whole of Europe for the ICC. And I have four recordings with him. Uh, one of them is about 50 minutes. And the guy is a, a clueless individual who just bullies and controls people. He's a very, very highly aggressive, manipulative, bullying person. And he focuses on young students away from home for the first time. You know, these people are cornered by the ICC. They're encouraged to go to Bible studies. Um, personal details of um, their private life is weaned out of them. So it can be used against them later on. And I'm really, really pleased because I've got four videos up. YouTube and a backup channel on BitChute where I dialogue with Michael Williamson. He's one of 550 similar videos which I've had with uh, non-Jehovah's Witnesses. And, you know, if parents, um, if their children get involved in the ICC, then hopefully um, my videos with the ICC will be of some help to some parents whose kids get caught up in this horrible cult. And I've also spoken to um, other British ICC leaders and I'm now speaking to American ICC leaders. It's very difficult because they rarely answer the phone. Again, they've changed like Jehovah's Witnesses. They used to be hyper, hyper aggressive, uh, very much based on sales. And if you gave them your telephone number, they'd be pestering you all the time. This is in the 1980s, since before the days of mobile phones. You give them a landline number, they'd be pestering you to come to all these meetings. Um, but they seem to have cooled down. They don't seem to have the zeal that they used to have. They're still rather nasty, um, but they're not as persistent as they used to be. And I notice that with a lot of different groups, particularly Jehovah's Witnesses. Since, since the institution of the JW.org website, and the cart work. Many Jehovah's Witnesses don't really seem to bother to, to learn their doctrines very thoroughly. I'm not accusing you of this, sir, because you do seem to know them thoroughly. But um, many Jehovah's Witnesses seem to have a very surface and very weak understanding of their doctrines. They just tell people, go to jw.org and do some research. And it's like that in many different groups, Pentecostals, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, the ICC didn't exist in the 1980s, but a similar group, the International Church of Christ, did. And all of these groups seem to have sort of cooled off. And they don't have the zeal that they had in the 1980s. Um, the difference would be me. Uh, I had zeal in the late 1980s. I left oneness in 1989. But I seem to be getting hotter and hotter and more and more zealous as the years go by. <laughs> Would I would I be accurate in assuming that you mentioned re these recordings that we are recording this conversation? Yes, sir. I always record the conversations because when I put them up, it demonstrates that the leaders of these various cults are in you know ninety nine times out of a hundred unable to prove the claims of their religious group, whether it's Mormons or International Christian Church or Oneness Pentecostals or Jehovah's Witness or Mormon. You see, there's nothing, there's nothing more hurtful to a religious group than asking them a question about their belief 
quoting their literature to them and saying, could you please explain your belief from your literature and you quote your, their literature to, to them and they've got no response. They, they can't prove their beliefs. They can't establish their beliefs. All they can really do is say, well, Robert, you have a horrible attitude. You're so proud. You're, you're full of bitterness. You're, you, there's no love in you. You, you. you don't build up. You're critical. And all of the groups say that basically um, these sort of things to me. Um, but they, they cannot defend their beliefs. Try to speak to a guy from Winner's Chapel. Again, I always go for the pastors because... Um, in order to get the telephone numbers off the internet, they're not going to put junior people's telephone numbers online. So when you go to the websites for Jehovah's Witnesses or Winner's Chapel or the Mormons or, or other similar groups, the telephone numbers I'm going to get are going to be those of people who are in a leadership position, usually pastors or in the case of Jehovah's Witnesses, it would usually be the Kobe, the presiding elder over the body of elders um, and that's who I I target I had a great discussion the other week with a circuit overseer from Wales that was a good conversation people have found that very very helpful the poor man was literally hung drawn and quartered by me um, I shouldn't brag but it is one of my weaknesses because you see I used to be in a cult I was roped into uh, attending a few meetings at the uh, London Church of Christ in 1986. And then I was in the oneness for about nine or ten months, which was terrible. But it taught me to think for myself. And um, I've simply seen so much abuse, so much hurt, so much abuse, so much wickedness in so many different religious groups. And believe me, uh, many religious groups will say Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, they're a cult. But you'll find almost as much abuse amongst evangelical Christians. The only difference is they don't want to admit it. It's swept under the carpet. Just as Jehovah's Witnesses sweep their abuses under the carpet. And the Mormons sweep their abuses under the carpet. And everyone points the finger at everyone else. Um, but there's tremendous abuse in a lot of different groups. Because there's no accountability. That's the main problem. Uh, I'm a very firm believer that churches should be run by a plurality of unpaid elders. If you don't pay anyone a salary and you do what you do unpaid um, and you have a plurality of elders, it's going to be far more difficult to corrupt an organisation. Once you start paying one person a salary, um, other factors come in. And, and, that, and that really started with Constantine anyway. It was Constantine who wanted to use Christianity as a form of control over his empire. Um, yeah. And so I think that the having... The Council of Nicaea, right? No, no, I'm not talking about the Council of Nicaea. Um, I'm talking about Constantine. After the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, he became the sole emperor of the whole Roman Empire. There, there was four. There was four. There was a Caesar and an Augustus in the east and a Caesar and Augustus in the west. Constantine was um, the Caesar in the West. He was based in the north of England. When he took over, oh, yeah, he, he wanted... I was referring to just the, the Christian indoctrination of that. Well, you need to prove that. It's no good just saying that. You would need to prove that to me. And not now, I'm too tired, but at another time. I'm happy, happy to speak again. Um, but um, I think the church became corrupted in various ways. One way was that Constantine brought in the idea of a pyramid structure. You pay everyone money. Um, you've got four metropolitans at the top. Um, beneath them you have the bishops. And then beneath them you have the, the priests. Each priest over an individual building. Um, I think when they, had the, when they had this pyramid structure with everyone receiving a salary, um, it became very difficult to sort of have a dialogue or to challenge the system um, and I think it became corrupted I think if you go back to the New Testament they didn't have buildings I'm not saying it's a sin or wrong to have a building but it just it just starts to corrupt things when you have a building and one person in charge of the building who receives a salary the money goes to one family in the fellowship over time um, 
the tendency is to treat that one family more favorably than than everyone else. I think that's how Constantine corrupted it. I think the British corrupted the gospel in in the Victorian age after Waterloo, Britain was the most powerful nation in the world for about a hundred years until the end of the First World War when America took over. So during that hundred 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 years, uh, Britain corrupted the gospel by introducing social class. So if you wanted to be um, a member of the Church of England, you know, you and I would go along and we'd pro probably be made into a deacon, maybe an elder. It'd be very difficult for us to become a, a priest. It could happen, but it was unusual. And we certainly would never be a bishop because the English, what they did to the gospel was they said... The leaders have to be the sons of dukes and earls. You have to have, your father has to have a special title because social class was so important to, to Britain. I mean, if you live in Oklahoma in the USA, it's a huge open expanse. You're not going to be too bothered about social class and social status and, you know, calling people my lord and bowing to the royal family and things, things like that. But Britain's a very small island. So like Japan, which is also a small island, it's a very strong system of social class and a pecking order with the royal family at the top and the plebs at the bottom. I'd be one of the plebs. And if you wanted to be a bishop in the Church of England, they'd simply look for a priest who was the son of a duke or the son of an earl. It didn't matter. The guy was a complete idiot. They promoted people on the basis of social class. Uh, that's how the British corrupted the gospel. And you look at that and you say, that's bad. And I would agree with you that there's a remnant of that today in some British Calvinist groups where um, they tend to promote within the fellowship junior doctors because they favour middle class people over working class people. Uh, and that's something that I've seen. Of course, they will deny it, but it's true. <laughs> in British, some British Calvinist groups favour middle class people over working class people. So that's a remnant that still happens today in some British Calvinist groups. Not all. I'm not saying it happens in all of them. The Americans made the gospel a thousand times worse than anything Constantine had done or the British had done. Um, when Henry Ford produced his production line to produce the Model, Model T Ford, you could literally get people off the street and say, here, bloke, Here's a spanner, tighten these three screws. And so you had a production line that was set up by people that were very intelligent. But the people working on the production line could be completely clueless. All they knew was they had to tighten these three bolts or put a chair in and then tighten these bolts or put a steering wheel in and then tighten the bolt for the steering wheel. And so you had a long production line of people who didn't know anything at all about motor cars or, or engines. They just did simple tasks. That seemed to be applied, this, this um, production line, to all sorts of things in American culture. I mean, the same thing was applied uh, in the fast food industry to McDonald's and Burger King. You could get people off the street with no knowledge of cooking, no experience whatsoever, and within 10 minutes they're making Big Mac burgers. Because they'd say, well, chop this lettuce like this. That's it. That's all you have to do. Next week, you might be told to put the fries in for exactly two minutes and 45 seconds at this temperature. Give them a shake, put salt on them and then cook more fries. So you had people working in Burger King and McDonald's who had no experience of culinary skills whatsoever. If you, if you gave them some raw meat and some vegetables, they wouldn't know what to do. They, they, they couldn't cook a meal. The same thing seems to be applied by the Americans to religion. You have a production line of people who are involved in religion and what they've done is they've given glossy American brochures or there's some overall sales routine. You see this in the International Christian Church particularly, but I think also to a certain extent with Jehovah's Witness literature, where a company will produce glossy literature that looks very impressive, but it's got absolutely no substance. And then people are told to peddle this to strangers, either by 
approaching people in the street, uh, International Christian Church and the, um, the Boston Movement, the Boston Church of Christ. I came across the London branch in 1986. They do tubing. They speak to strangers on tubes. That's tube trains in London. That's how I got to, to speak to them. Jehovah's Witnesses have the carts. But the thing is, what Americans did was they, 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 they mixed, they merged the gospel with a sales, with a sales ethos and a production line ethos. So you will have a church and lots of people in the church don't know anything at all about the Bible. But if the overall organization produces glossy literature, the individual people who are distributing this literature don't need to know the Bible. They just tell people to go to jw.org or to lds.org or sda.org or to the ICC website, to some website. And their clever people who are clever people will uh, answer all their questions or supposedly answer all their questions. Although in reality, all of these websites are really rather, rather superficial. So the British ad uh, corrupted the gospel by adding the social class. But the Americans, far worse, they added money and business and selling acumen. Um, lots of people connected to Donald Trump, for instance, are very much involved in pyramid selling. Uh, there's lots of American so-called Christian businesses that are basically pyramid selling schemes. So I recruit you and three other people, right? And I then get money from your sales but you have to recruit other people. And if you recruit six people, you will get money from their sales as well as the sales that you're making. And the person over me who recruited me will get money from my sales, from your sales, and all the people beneath you as well. And it's just multi-level marketing. This is what America seems to have done to the gospel. And please, I'm, you see, some of the best Christian scholars in the world, um, Daniel Wallace, um, the evangelist um, James White, who, who debates all sorts of different groups. Some of the best Christian scholars in the world are definitely American. They're not British. I think that they're the best. There's some incredible Christian scholars who are American, but nobody listens to them. Because the whole emphasis on America is on selling and this production line model where you've got complete idiots who know nothing at all about the, the, the motor car. They, they could make a Model T Ford and they wouldn't have a clue how a car works. They just tighten these bolts or put a seat in. And the same thing was applied to fast food in McDonald's and it was applied to the American churches. And the American churches have just become a money-making business uh, to, to some extent. And unfortunately, um, the people who are promoted on American TV aren't the great phenomenal American scholars like Daniel Wallace, the late Michael Heiser, James White. Um, it's the complete idiots. It's the Benny Hins, the Kenneth Copelands, the absolute raving lunatics who've corrupted the gospel by adding American salesmanship and razzmatazz to it and corrupting the gospel far more than even the British did. Or Constantine. Anyway, I've talked long enough. You certainly are a wealth of information. Well, all I try and do is listen to people who are a lot smarter than me. So I try and read books or I listen to videos by people who will know a lot more about the Bible than I do. I don't listen to Pastor Billy Bob. I don't waste my time banging a tambourine in the local happy clappy church. I try and listen to and, and read books by educated people who are a lot smarter than me. And then I try and learn from these people. And I've got little cards. I'm holding one in my hand. Uh, I've got thousands of these little cards. And when I learn something, I write what I learn as a question in black on one side. And then I answer the question in red on the other side. And then I laminate the card and I've got thousands of these. So I, 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 I've also got a wide margin Bible where I write notes. So I try to remember clever things that I learn from other people who a lot know a lot more than I do. 
And that's all you need to do in life. You just need to learn one or two things a day. If you learn one or two things a day, in five years you're going to be a really smart person. It doesn't matter what you do, whether it's an, an electrician or a bricklayer, a salesman, or any religious endeavour. If you just learn just one thing a day, just learn one thing a day, in five years that's going to be 250 things that you've learned. And the sad thing is, as I've gone through my life, I'm 62 now, what I've found out is that most religious people don't learn anything. That's why, that's why, you know, it doesn't matter where you go. Honestly, the denominational title is irrelevant. Most religious people don't know what they're talking about. And most religion is a complete waste of your time. Just look at the people who go to these buildings. Most of them are idiots. And the ones who are not idiots have got no passion or zeal for whichever god they worship. And, and, and most of them can't hold a conversation. Why do I need to mix with these people? What are these people going to teach me? And so I decided to spend my time, many years ago I decided to spend my time talking to people, because that's how you learn. And also trying to read. Um, I mean, YouTube wasn't, wasn't around at the time, but I remember I had 2,000 cassettes um, back in the 1990s when I digitalised my collection. Um, and I try to listen to people who are the best scholars in their field. You know, avoid Brother Billy Bob. Avoid people who bang a tambourine. And be very wary of people with glossy literature. That's got all the answers to everything. I don't care what the name of the group is. They're all the same. Beware of glossy literature because often the people producing it don't know what they're talking about. It's just, uh, it's just American razzmatazz. Anyway, I've got to go. Thank you very much. If you want to speak again about the resurrection, um, give, me a, give me a text. Well, it's, 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 it's been enjoyable and interesting, Robert. All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.